In the first two videos, we looked at the pathology of common causes for anemia. In this video, we'll take a look at a clinical approach, considering how we can diagnose the causes of anemia. In practice, when discussing anemia, most people are referring to a haemoglobin concentration, which is below the normal range for a population. Less often, anemia is discussed in terms of the hematocrit, which refers to the red blood cell portion of a centrifuge blood sample. If red blood cells make up, for example, 45% of the volume, the hematocrit would be 0.45. A useful clue to the cause of anemia is the mean cell volume, or MCV. Anemia with a low MCV is microcytic, normal MCV is normocytic, and high MCV is macrocytic. Amongst the causes of microcytic anemia are iron deficiency, which is the most common, thalassemia, and anemia of chronic disease, which can have a low or a normal MCV. Anemia with a normal MCV is a normocytic anemia. Causes of normocytic anemia include acute blood loss. Now, chronic blood loss is associated with microcytic anemia caused by iron deficiency, but in acute blood loss, nothing is different about the size of the cells, there are just fewer of them, hence it is normocytic. Anemia of chronic disease is another cause, and that can be microcytic or normocytic. Also, we need to think about any of the hemolytic anemias, which include hereditary problems like sickle cell disease, but also acquired disorders such as autoimmune hemolytic anemia, erythropoietin deficiency, as found in renal disease, and finally, marrow disorders. Marrow disorders can include things like myeloma, leukemia, lymphoma, myelofibrosis, metastases from other cancers, aplastic anemia, and myelodysplastic syndrome. Anemia with high MCV is macrocytic anemia. Causes of macrocytic anemia are B12 or folate deficiency, which are also referred to as megaloblastic anemia, thyroid disease, liver disease, alcohol abuse, certain drugs, for example, things like methotrexate and azathioprine, and myelodysplastic syndrome, which can cause a macrocytic or normocytic anemia. If you aren't sure about any of the diseases, check out the first two videos in this series on anemia for a discussion about pathology. So in a patient with anemia, we tend to look at the MCV for a first clue as to the cause. But what comes next? Well, basic information about the patient and their history will be very useful. For example, a microcytic anemia in an older person is iron deficiency due to gastrointestinal malignancy until proven otherwise. If the patient has, for example, rheumatoid arthritis, we should consider anemia of chronic disease as the cause. A patient with macrocytic anemia may tell us that they're taking methotrexate or have been overusing alcohol. They may have symptoms of thyroid disease. A patient with B12 deficiency might have other symptoms like a sore tongue or neurological deficits. But in fact, there'll be many occasions where you'll not get to a diagnosis quite so easily and we'll have to order further tests to investigate anemia. You'll often wonder, what test should I order next? Obviously, this depends on the clinical situation, but there are some broad rules about this in relation to the MCV. In a patient with microcytic anemia, the next test to order will be ferritin to give you an estimate of their iron levels. Bear in mind that ferritin is an acute phase protein and will be high in the presence of inflammation. For this reason, it's always worth requesting a CRP with your ferritin. And if the iron level is low, where do you go next? In an older patient, iron deficiency is associated with gastrointestinal cancer. Therefore, they need urgent upper and lower gastrointestinal endoscopy. If this is a female patient of childbearing age, you need to take a careful menstrual history as this is often the cause. Unexplained iron deficiency should also raise the possibility of celiac disease too, and this will require revisiting the history and perhaps looking for an anti-TTG antibody in your blood tests. If the iron is normal, you might consider an alternative diagnosis which will include thalassemia, especially if there is a family history. In thalassemia major, which is the homozygous disease, Patients will present in the first few years of life, 
usually with quite dramatic symptoms, but in thalassemia minor, which is the heterozygous disease, the patient may be asymptomatic. Hemoglobin electrophoresis is the first test to diagnose thalassemia. You should also consider other diagnoses, such as anemia of chronic disease, which can cause either a microcytic anemia or usually a normocytic anemia. Normocytic anemia can be tricky. The most useful tests here will be a blood film and a reticular site count. A blood film test involves a biomedical scientist spreading the patient's blood sample on a glass slide and looking at it under a microscope. It can give us valuable clues as to the diagnosis. For example, they might see sickling cells, spherocytes, or signs of a marrow disorder. The reticular site count is a very underused test. So what exactly is a reticular site? As you might remember, mature red blood cells don't have a nucleus. They don't have any nuclear material within them. Young red blood cells, which are fresh out of the marrow, still carry around their RNA for a couple of days before shedding it. These young red blood cells are called reticulocytes. Normally, the marrow has a huge capacity for increasing red blood cell production and will do this to compensate for anemia, causing an increased number of reticulocytes. However, if the anemia is caused by a problem with the marrow, or if the patient has a deficiency of iron, B12 or folate, or if there is no erythropoietin, it won't be able to increase the red cell production and the reticular site count will be normal or low. So, we can therefore use the reticular site count to decide whether an anemia is caused by a reduced production of red cells from the bone marrow or death of red blood cells, which is called hemolysis. If the reticular sites are high, you can consider hemolysis as a cause. Of course, there are many diseases which cause hemolysis. As we said, a blood film is a good place to start. For example, you can see fragments of red blood cells that have been broken down mechanically, or the bite cells of G6PD deficiency. LDH is often raised in hemolysis. Bilirubin and haptoglobin may be useful in differentiating between extravascular or intravascular causes of hemolysis. With bilirubin raised and haptoglobin reduced in diseases that cause intravascular hemolysis, such as HUS or TTP, Mechanical, intravascular hemolytic diseases like this are definitely bad news. If there's a suggestion of hemolysis, you should request a direct Coombs test, which will be positive in autoimmune hemolytic anemia. The direct Coombs test is essentially looking for antibodies which are directed at the patient's red blood cells. Chronic hemolytic diseases like sickle cell or G6PD deficiency often have a family history. There are specific tests for these conditions, for example, hemoglobin electrophoresis to look for sickle cell disease or G6PD enzyme activity. Normocytic anemia with a normal or decreased reticular site count indicates a marrow problem or erythropoietin deficiency. If there is concern that the bone marrow is causing the problem, then a bone marrow biopsy will often be needed. Before this, you should test for paraprotein in urine and serum, which, if positive, may lead you to a diagnosis of myeloma. Now onto macrocytic anemia. Again, a blood film may give you useful information. B12 and folate are not only used in the production of red blood cells, but also white cells and platelets too. Sometimes we can see characteristic changes in neutrophils in the blood film, specifically hypersegmented neutrophils, which have more blobs in their nucleus than the average neutrophil. Of course, B12 and folate levels are very useful in macrocytic anemia, but be aware that the test for B12 isn't perfect, and many patients who truly have a B12 deficiency will have apparently normal B12 levels on the labs. Therefore, in patients who suspect B12 deficiency, and have a normal B12 level, you should consider a trial of therapy or second line tests such as a serum homocysteine or methyl malonic acid if they're available. If you've reason to suspect that a patient has got B12 deficiency, you should test for intrinsic factor antibodies, which is the most commonly used test for pernicious anemia. These will, however, only be positive in about 50% of cases of pernicious anemia, so you'll need to keep an open mind. Patients with pernicious anemia will need lifelong B12 replacement, which in the UK is given by intramuscular injection. Another cause for macrocytic anemia is myelodysplastic syndrome, 
which can be a difficult diagnosis to make. The blood film may have characteristic dysplastic changes, but can also be normal. It's more likely to be suspected if more than one cell line is affected, in other words, if there are low platelets or white cells. Patients with unexplained cytopenias are often referred to a haematologist who may perform a bone marrow biopsy. This is often how a patient arrives at a diagnosis of myelodysplastic syndrome. And generally, myelodysplastic syndrome is a disease of the elderly. So, in summary, a microcytic anemia should always make us think of iron deficiency and we should suspect loss of blood from the gut due to cancer in older patients. Tests that can help in a diagnosis in the cause of anormocytic anemia include a blood film and reticulocyte count. Bilirubin, LDH, haptoglobin and a direct Coombs test can suggest a cause for hemolysis and we can use specific tests to look for hereditary causes of anemia. Paraproteins in the urine or serum raise the possibility of myeloma. Other bone marrow cancers can require a bone marrow biopsy for diagnosis. Tests for macrocytic anemia include B12, folate and a blood film and we should also think about other tests like liver function tests and thyroid function tests. I hope you've enjoyed this last tutorial on anemia. Check out our clinical cases in anemia to test your knowledge and your diagnostic skills.